Okay, Skip Crilly. Um, he's giving a talk on interstellar communications method, system design and observations. Uh, he's an electrical engineer and amateur astronomer. Currently a volunteer science ambassador in education and public outreach at the Green Bank Observatory. Skip's primary job at Green Bank is the engineering support of the 40 meter foot, um, 40 foot uh, educational telescope. Go ahead, Skip. Okay, thank you, Rich. Um, can, can people see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. And let me make sure it, it, it scrolls. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Skip Grilly, and um, you've seen this slide before because this was one of, this was a slide I gave uh, in a previous presentation. Um, so this is an update of the project that many of you know about that started about, oh, four or five years ago to um, operate synchronized radio telescopes uh, distantly separated um, in, in the uh, 1395 to 1455 band um, to do a study project. And this started with a conversation that Rich Russell and I had at, at Green Bank at, a, at one of the SARA conferences about the idea of using the 60 foot together with 40 foot. And a um, little background on me, I'm a it's now retired, except I'm kind of working more than I used to uh, uh, most of the time. Um, but I work at Green Bank for the last seven years uh, on the 40-foot telescope, and I'm a volunteer. Uh, so I've, I've done the a lot of recent engineering improvements to the 40-foot telescope, replaced a fair amount of the electronics in it. Uh, and then I get to observe with it but when, I'm, when I'm in Green Bank, and I've been to Green Bank about 56 times from my home. And, New Hampshire now, uh, commuting by car. So when I when I've been at Green Bank since around 2017, I've been setting my computer, my SETI computer up uh, uh, on the 40 foot telescope and and using it to um, observe, which I normally have. I have computers running on my 26 foot dish that's up in the corner there on my farm in New Hampshire. So so Rich and I and and others. Um, uh, helped out uh, Steve, Steve Block, Ed Korn, a lot of other people. In fact, the DSCS members were amazing in doing a bunch of refurbishment on uh, the site, the telescope, the electronics in there and everything. And so there are computers set up at, at each one of these locations that are synchronized in frequency and time using GPS satellites. Um, and um, and they, they separately record 1395 to 1455 megahertz and 3.7 hertz channels over, over that band um, with a, with a approximately quarter second, 0.27 seconds of, of um, integration time on the FFTs. And this data is stored at, at above a 12 dB threshold, which basically kind of allows the, um, uh, it allows the, the system to run can continuously 24-7 while we're doing observations and be post-processed later. So I'm looking for simultaneous signals arriving on the three telescopes at the same time on the same frequency and within calculated Doppler offsets for the various the telescopes and where they're located on the Earth and based on the pointing direction. Now, it, it's kind of a long story, but I've I focused on minus 7.6 degrees declination as a result of a observation that I was uh, given for, in Breakthrough Listen. I, I'm, a, I'm also a, a collaborator on the Breakthrough Listen team and I got some time on the Greenback Telescope, which is in the background in a 40 foot uh, image here. Um, and uh, 40 Ardani seemed to have some interesting pulses on the, uh, on the 40 foot. So I used the Greenback telescope to get some time on it and got some interesting results there. And that led me to, to want to continue to scan the minus 7.6 declination. So, so the telescopes are all aligned with beams overlapping in direction along the minus 7.6 declination. And we just scanned the entire, um, uh, the, all around the arc and saved data. So, so David Messerschmidt, a professor at Berkeley, about eight years ago was given a grant from the SETI Institute to write a 
uh, technical paper on um, ideal interstellar communication systems. And it, it, it is an amazing um, a book, basically. The paper is 280 something pages and, and then he's written follow-ups to that. And if you're familiar with the, with the preprint server called Archive, A-R-X-I-V for, for scientific papers, you can find David Messerschmitt's paper by um, Googling or by going to Archive. It's a Cornell University preprint server for people who want to submit scientific papers. Um, the paper that, that I presented for this proceedings is a paper that I submitted in May of this year covering the post-processing of, of the data that has been taken since 2017 of the, of the multiple telescopes together with um, about 160, 164 days of transits of the 26-foot dish on my farm. And those two two observations together are captured in the in the first paper, and that's in an archive paper which I referenced uh, down below. And the the, um, uh, the half of the presentation that I'm going to give covers that paper with some key slides out of the paper. Um, and I'd like to kind of go over these things pretty quickly because I I love questions. So we'll see what happens. Um, and I guess as far as the system design, it's explained in in a lot of detail and it's in the proceedings as far as how the electronics is capturing the signals, et cetera. And, and, I'm doing, and also the post-processing, the RFI elimination algorithms and all that sort of thing is all written up in that. But you know, I'd be happy to talk about that. So what I'm, what I'm looking at is what, what I'm looking for rather in strange signals is something that David Messerschmitt talks about, which are these energy bundles. And the idea is, is that if you wanna build a really efficient communication system, energy efficient bandwidth, unlimited potentially, um, and, uh, you know, you know, so, and, and carrying a lot of capacity, a lot of information capacity. So energy per bit optimized, and this is, has to do with Shannon's uh, theorem. You concentrate the energy in a bundle in a, in a short period of time over a, short, a very small frequency, and that jumps out of the Gaussian noise and, and becomes essentially like a Poisson um, uh, distribution for the high SNR events. And those high SNR events can then be distinguished from each other. So what I'm looking at are what SETI people and astronomers have been talking about for a long time, which is that the communications might be sent on different polarizations. And so the signals that I post-processed in the, in the paper, in the first archive paper that, that is in the proceedings, um, is, is bundles of energy that are confined to 3.7 hertz and over a 0.27 second interval spaced by a short period of time. Now, I, I was thinking, well, what should that be? And it turns out in the first paper, I talk about delta T equals zero. So this is basically kind of like the most odd event, which is that why should two oppositely circularly polarized pulses be present on the same at the same time actually, and on on uh, frequency spacings that are very very small, and that's that can be computed. And in the paper, I go through the mathematics of how that those probabilities can be commuted, com computed. Now, with regards to a hypothesis, so the paper talks about a hypothesis. I want to point out very clearly that there are so many possible causes for these types of signals that we have to peel the onion with causes and the and cause needs to be stated in the hypothesis. You know, we're testing against this cause. So I've started with just noise and, and the, the uh, hypothesis is, is that these pulses can be explained by noise. So I wanna make it clear that working our way down to interstellar communication systems to explain these pulses is, is a very, very long process, way past RFI, methodology, equipment problems, spurious in the receiver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's so many potential causes. This is just to, to, to say, okay, can noise produce these? And that's what the first paper does. So in the second paper, I tested an idea to eliminate some of the RFI. And I'll, I'll just go over this quickly, but I'll get to this later when I do the second 
part of this. And that is that I was finding in the, in the second paper, which was a 40 day follow up observation of using only the 26 foot on my dish or a dish on my farm, that there were some closely spaced in frequency pulses that were appearing sometimes on the same day. And it appeared that this could be RFI. So I speculated that there was a Doppler spread issue for some sort of uh, narrowband signals. And I changed the filter for the delta F of the polar, polarized pulses to exclude everything below 80 Hertz. Okay. Then I also found that there were some pulse pairs in my follow-up in the using the 40 foot, and those pulse pairs happened at exactly the same time. And I thought, well, that requires extra energy at the very, very same time. Maybe this. Maybe a transmitter is energy limited and it's unable to do that. So I looked for only pulse pairs that occurred with spacing greater than zero seconds. And the time was limited to three seconds. So I only looked for polarized pulse pairs that are within plus or minus three seconds. Okay, so I think I probably have covered most of this. Uh, this, this shows the Messerschmitt's, um, David Messerschmitt's uh, reference down below. Um, okay, now with regards to direction, the hypothesis also says that the pulses that, that pass through the post-processing filters um, from the original raw data on the telescopes is going to have a um, anomaly in the 5.1 to 5.4 right ascension direction and, uh, and along the minus 7.6 declination arc that's scanned, scanned all 24-7. The, the, um, the reason for this is some, some of you know, because in a previous presentation in, 20, in, in uh, August of 2018, um, the two telescopes, the Haswell and the Green Bank showed anomalies that appeared on August 15th, 16th. And I presented those in a previous paper. So in, in the previous Sarah presentation. So that led to the hypothesis in this archive paper that I just uh, submitted and was, was announced in, in May, the idea that I can hypothesize that there will be a, um, essentially a, a sort of an anomaly of more pulses than can be explained due to noise in the 5.1 to 5.4. 5.1 to 5.4 is in the direction approximately of Rigel. It's, it's above Rigel uh, at minus 7.6, a little bit nor north. Um, Rigel is the star that's the west uh, foot of uh, Orion, the hunter, and uh, it's very, very bright. Um, uh, you know, it, it's strictly at this point just a marker. I just use that as I say Rigel. You know, that that refers to this unusual pointing direction that seems to have some some things. Which again, I'm I'm going to be very clear. I'm not <laughs> trying to connect this to anything. Uh, celestial yet. You know, we got a lot of work to do before we can talk about any of that. So this covers the November 2017 to February 2019 uh, Green Bank and Haswell observations, which involved a lot of hours of uh, Steve Plock and I going to Green Bank and, and Haswell and spending a lot of time together at each site. The telescopes, the, the observations were running autonomously, no communication between the computers. Um, and this was, was what resulted uh, in, the, in the two green dots there on the August uh, 2018 observations. And around the, the, the right ascension sphere, or, or circle rather, there wasn't much else that lined up together, but it was kind of interesting that those two lined up. So in the paper, I, and when I, I redid the post-processing using the filtering that I was talking about, in the, and not in the, in the second paper, but for the first paper, of the dual polarized pulse pairs, and I did the days that were um, that were anomalous, and it turned out April, August fifteenth, sixteenth, twenty eighteen, and April second and, and third, twenty nineteen, are in these two tables, and these are in the paper, and and it's explained in more detail. the the, the unusual problem here is that there were four pulses, pulse pairs, that were present out of uh, this is twelve. Uh, pulse pairs total in the 24 hours of right ascension that we scanned during those two observations that were 
four days, roughly, you know, in the, and the probability of seeing four of these things at out of 12 using a binomial is extremely small. Now, we have to say, well, there's 70 other directions, 80, 80 directions for a 0.3 hours over 24 hours. So we got to multiply this number by 80. But if we take the 3.3 times 10 to the minus 7 multiplied by 80, we still get a pretty pretty small number. It, was, it just looks unusual to see four of these things in the same uh, pointing, pointing direction or close to it um, during those observations. And, and again, this did not. Uh, look at all of the observations we took. Some, some we had some problems with, and uh, some, you know, just are just not included in this. So there might be an issue here where, well, this data is only based on two sets of observations when we had about seven. So you got to multiply by about five because you know you took you took more data than it, than is being shown in the results. So so there's a bunch of statistical things that have to be worked out in all of these probabilities. So one of the things that that I, I calculate in the paper, and, and this is was this is a slide from a previous presentation, Sarah presentation, is just the math associated with how you calculate the delta F, given that it's a Poisson process, that the delta F between polarizations or between pulses that are on on the same polarization. So if you want to increase the information capacity, you could transmit small delta Fs on on different polarizations or transmit se separate delta Fs on the same polarization signal. Both of them end up being able to add bits to the information. And this was a slide I also showed in previous Sarah presentation, but it, it's, it's a little bit better, I think, in some sense than the graphical or, or than the tabular and other graphical things. But the paper goes into all four days of anomalous pulses that occurred at the same time as those close tones that I showed in the two tables. So in other words, if we say to ourselves, okay, we've got these four close tones, what's up with them? And then examine the entire spectrum and look for close tones uh, in polarization or in the same polarization, we see something like this, this plot here. And it shows a whole series of close tones on April on the April 2nd, 2019. And in the paper, I, I show it in a little bit different way using a calculation that calculates the probability of, the, of these spacings occurring um, in, in, uh, at the same time as the, as the time of, of the uh, simultaneous pulse. The simultaneous pulse is over on the left where it says 5.8 hertz offset. And that, that becomes sort of a significant event. It's, it's approximately where the, the variance of the uh, calculation of of Doppler offset, of beam effect, because the Doppler changes slightly across the beam. And uh, so it becomes a significant event. And then that significant event drives all these other apparently strange closed tones that should not be present in noise. So that ends up, I, I put it in the, in the paper, the, and it's in the proceedings, the calculations of these rare events. And three of the four days showed these unusual kinds of things. So it's kind of, uh, that's interesting. So. So during the peak of the pandemic, um, I ran 164 days of transits of the 26 foot telescope, applying the same software, the same algorithm that I wrote for the uh, search for dual polarized uh, simultaneous pulses. And the idea is, is to um, look at the number of pulses now that I, I can uh, you know, scan the sky and see if there's anything in a 5.1 to 5.4 direction. And this is um, this isn't com as complete as I would like because I only scanned, I only processed five right ascensions around and centered at 5.1 to 5.4. Um, and at some point, I plan to redo it with 24 hours. Um, the follow-up that I did for 40 hours. Is that is in the second paper, which is you know that's not in the proceedings, but you can get it, you can see it in archive. That does the full 24 hours, and I'll get to that in a minute. Well, it turns out that that the 5.1. Okay, so let me explain this plot. So I sort the R, the SNR, the signal to noise ratio, of the of the polarized pair and the maximum of it, and and I, I use either the maximum uh, or or the or the or the minimum of the two. Um, and that I go into the paper about why that is. It's, it, 
it, it's sort of a, a question of, you know, is it is it more important that the highest of the two pulses be sorted or should the next one? Because if you take the second one, then you're ensured that the other one is a little bit higher. And and I get a little bit difference, but I just had, I had previously always been using um, this, this one, which, uh, oh, yeah. I got to I got to go back and check but but this this is the SNR over here at high at zero sample that the at, but that should really be a one trial on the left and then um the SNR drops off as you go along so there's this there's this dip okay so this is the binomial density of the number of pulses expected at the level of trials so given a, a probability of a pulse um, in in the um, right ascension window, we can calculate how many should be there, and and it turns out that if if the if the line dips down, it could be due to the fact that there are not enough pulses present in that direction, or there are too many pulses pulse pairs in that direction, and it turns out that if the if the line transitions downward and then slopes upward then that's telling us that there are too many pulses in that um, right ascension. And uh, if it slopes the other way, that means that there's not enough because it's saying, hey, the probability is going down. There, there's something wrong here. The binomial is you know, centered on expecting the average value of the number of pulses in that. So, so there is a dip in the 5.1 to 5.4, multiple dips actually. And then the other right ascension seem to have what would be expected due to a noise-like um, phenomena, you know, additive white Gaussian noise uh, driving the system. So I, I modified the window of the, um, of the filter for the right ascension and the, the probability dropped uh, for the 5.1. This is a 5.17 to 5.39 hour right ascension. Um, and it, it dropped, and the other ones didn't didn't really change. And I've, I've done some simulations of with noise uh, to try to find, or, or with with um, noise driven into the software to, to see if there's any anomalies in the way I'm processing this. Um, and I'm, I haven't I haven't finished all that work yet. There's still a lot of work to do in that. So then I did a noise test where I spent 44 days after that 40 day, or, or after the 164 day test. I ran uh, 44 days with a noise source connected to one of the polarizations. So the signal comes from the telescope through fiber. And then uh, I, I broke the path going into the RF receiver on one of the polarizations, applied a test noise source and said, okay, if I put a noise source into one of the polarizations, then my filter, if there's, if there's a signal due to my software or some other problem, Present, then it's going to some. It's going to show these these extraneous pulses that are still there at a at a particular right ascension, um, even with noise. So I said, okay, you know, let me see what happens with the noise. So I ran that for for forty four days, and uh, I saw this result here, which shows the binomial uh, probability density. Uh, it 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 dropped, but the direction of the lines are down, which says that. During that um, during that time, it dropped uh, due to not enough pulses in the 5.1 to 5.4 right ascension direction compared to the others. And I, I, in some of the simulations I've done, I've shown that you can you can do this with just plain noise going into the into the algorithm, and it, with even with 44 days, you can get numbers like 0.01 that they, they will pop out every now and then on some pointing directions. So now I so th this is the the start of the the second paper, which is a um, forty day beam transit, where I took and processed um, twenty four hours of right ascension. Um, there's I haven't worked it all out, and I should be modifying my software to use all the threads to speed it up, but I'm only using one thread right now in my software. So uh, that meant that the one hundred sixty four days. <laughs> of data that I took um, 
took a very long time to run, okay, because I had lots and lots of files. Um, and uh, so, but in, in this case, I said, okay, let me just run a 40 day and run it for, for do 24 hours of processing on right ascension. And so I'm going to scroll through the, um, all of the 80 right ascensions around the minus 7.6 declination arc. Um, I, I'll kind of go through them fairly quickly, but you can, you'll, I think you'll get a picture of maybe what's going on here. But, but this is the same, same calculation. Of course, the filter is modified. So, you know, that, that throws a little bit of a confusion into the entire situation because I've modified my, my filter from the first observation to the second one. So that can cause, you know, all bets to be off and, and a lot of um, consideration of what's going on. Um, but the idea was to get rid of what looked like um, a Doppler spread in uh, terrestrial RFI. Um, so this is, this is the um, first 10 pointing directions uh, around um, and the lines are, they're kind of going down. There's one line that's going up there at 1.5 to 1.8. It has a probability of 0.01, which again, in 40 days, I tend to see. Um, and then here we go. There's a 5.1 to 5.4 dip, which is actually much lower than the dip I saw with the 164 day observation, um, which is getting kind of difficult to explain. It has a 0 0.00063 likelihood of occurring um, essentially per experiment uh, given a bunch of assumptions which all can make that number worse. So this is the next direction and, and it had an 8.4 to 8.7 right ascension with a similar dip in it out of the 10 in this range of right ascensions. Uh, this range of right ascensions had a couple that were down in the where you know noise just pops in it at uh, 0 0.01 occasionally on some pointing directions. Um, and a couple in here that are in the 0 0.01 region again. Um, the uh, nothing in this in this range of right ascensions, nothing in this range of right ascensions, except well, another one a little higher than I, when it gets to be higher than 0 0.01, I, I don't, you know, I, I think, well, all right, that could just be just noise. It, a lot depends on whether or not it goes down to 0.01 and then kind of stays there. If, if it goes down and then it continues to stay there, well, then we say, well, like at slightly lower signal to noise ratios, there's something else going on that's causing those lower signal to noise ratios, which depending on beams, the, where the beam is pointing and various things, it might be likely to expect that kind of thing. And then there was this gigantic set of pulses that were the highest pulses you can see it from the dots that are going down on the left over there um, that contributed a, a very large number of anomalous pulses and extremely, um, you know, sort of extremely low probability of occurring due to noise. Now, this turns out all almost, in fact, all of the pulses that were, that appear to be anomalous in this all happened on one of the modified Julian days. 593332. And they also happened with a two point, uh, I think it was a 2.4 or so megahertz spacing between them. So that kind of is telling me that, yeah, this might be RFI of some sort. Um, because you know, transmitting things on fixed offset frequencies all on the all on the same day might be good. It might be a kind of beacon of some sort, but it could also be RFI. So Whatever it is, it's not noise, so it doesn't fit the calculation on the hypothesis that noise should be the cause. So this is what the frequency versus day of the 5.1 to 5.4 uh, signals looked like in um, sort of overall. And these pulse pairs, they seem to pop up in these long observations of many, many days on not no specific frequency, no specific day, um, which at least far as frequency says that they may not be observation, they, they may be um, they may not be be um, 
uh, discovery signals because discovery signals you might want to pack in all in one day. And I, I've seen some of that, but these pulses that are pulse pairs that are anomalous in a particular right ascension might actually contain information that is, you know, that there's an attempt. You know, we should, you know, I, I, would, I should look. I've, and I've looked and I've tried to figure out it based on the frequency offsets and things. And, you know, if I can figure out what's, what, what might be going on with time and frequency offsets. And that's a, a lot of work. So the idea of decoding this separation in time and the separation of frequency between these, these pulse pairs is, it's, it's confounding right now. I'm, I haven't come up with any, uh, anything that makes sense. The, the spacings are close, the times are close, they're anomalous, they don't look like noise, they're happening on a lot of days, they're not on fixed frequencies, which I would expect with some sort of RFI. So there's lots of um, hypotheses here, um, and I, um, I can't uh, say that I'm anywhere very close to anything, you know, conclusions on this. The conclusions you can read in both of the papers are so, okay, we need to continue looking because it doesn't look like noise, but it's hard to explain what it is right now. So there's, there's a bunch of possible causes. And I'm working my way down this, this list of um, causes and trying various things. I'm building a, um, an interferometer of sorts. It's, it's really what I'm trying to do is increase the aperture of the 26 foot to the east so that I can decrease the right ascension range of uncertainty of these anomalous pulses and see if, if I can isolate it. I've, I've through the breakthrough listen group, I've, I've been uh, I've been told that, that if I want to uh, use the Greenback telescope, for example, to try to follow up on this, I can do that. And I've gotten an offer to do that. But I've said that I'm really in trouble right now because I have a very large right ascension and declination uncertainty, which involves about 100 beam scans of the Green Bank Telescope. And since these pulses are not very frequent, now they might be more frequent when I, when I get the GBT pointed right at it, but that's gonna take me some five, potentially 500 minutes, depending on the spacing of these pulses in time. So, um, so I'm holding off on that right now, but, um, but I'm certainly looking for anyone who wants to try setting something up anywhere. And, uh, and I'm, I'm prepared to do synchronized um, observations with you know, fairly large telescopes or whatever we wanna do. I can run 24 hours, 24 seven simultaneous observations with anyone who wants to do it using the telescope on my farm. Um, it may turn out that um, my dish on the farm is it's the the, the surface accuracy has has got some problems issues that, that I know about based on my measurements and um, it may turn out that a smaller dish you know a, a twenty foot uh, might be might just work and produce these same kind of anomalies um, so I point my telescope to match the beam of the forty foot which is south all the time so. If anyone can see the sky minus 7.6 declination wants to uh, try something, um, I'd be happy to help out and do what I can, you know, to 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 see see if we can do another, you know, simultaneous. And we're continuing to do simultaneous Haswell. Green Bank has been off for the long, you know, for all this duration during the pandemic. And uh, I was there on this trip. I'm currently on it on, in the West, but it was. Uh, I was on my, I was in West Virginia on this trip and uh, it's still, um, it's, it's still in a very restrained state of operation in terms of what people can do. And so I'm, I'm probably not going to be doing any Green Bank uh, Haswell simultaneous. We've been, we did a, a recent Haswell um, uh, New Hampshire and I looked at that, there, there looked like there were some problems in that we just did. So anyway, okay, so that's it. Um, just I uh, appreciate all the ideas and help and questions, et cetera. Um, I got to thank Steve Plock, Ed Korn, Rich, I mean, all the deep space exploration people who did so much amazing work on the Plushner telescope and uh, made that all made that all work. That was, that's been a, a lot of fun. <laughs> got to say thanks to all of them. Green Bank Observatory, the Breakthrough Listen team, Berkeley SETI Research Center. They've been helpful and like I presented to them and 
things that I'm working on and things. And of course, the SETI Institute that, you know, does so much of this work and family of friends. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Great. Um, I don't see any questions on chat yet. If you guys got questions, uh, got a few more minutes. I have to say that uh, Skip, if it wasn't for Skip, we wouldn't have uh, got a lot of the capability at the at the our Haswell site, uh, uh, particularly power uh, comms. And Skip, we just got internet, so we'll see how that works. And uh, then we got our uh, open house next uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So uh, we'll, hopefully, we get some good stuff going there. Okay, um, Skip, I don't think we got any questions. Uh, if you guys do have questions, go ahead and do it online or on the chat. And um, we'll go with the next person. <laughs>